Well, hello, and welcome to my talk on the physics of fusion and the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, otherwise known as ITER, which promises to provide cheap, abundant, clean, safe, and almost inexhaustible energy for humankind forever. At least that's the hope. My name is Tony Key. I'm a retired professor of uh, physics at the University of Toronto, and I hope to give you some basic idea about how fusion works and the current state of development of ITER, the biggest and grandest machine in the world, which is trying to realize uh, the promise of this energy. Our inspiration for this type of research has, of course, been the sun which has burned for millions and millions of years and will undoubtedly continue to burn for millions and millions more long after the human race has ceased to exist. The hope then is to create machines that can provide this type of fusion energy here on Earth. Like all stars, the sun is an enormous ball of gas, extremely hot, shining under its own power. The gases are hydrogen and helium, and its energy comes from nuclear fusion of these two elements. As you might expect, nuclear fusion means the sticking together of different nuclei, as opposed to fission, which involves the breaking up of nuclei. So the intention then is to reproduce this type of fusion energy here on Earth. I'd like to spend a few minutes on the basic nuclear physics. Everything in our universe is made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. As you know, the protons and the neutrons are themselves composite, but that is another story. At the temperatures required for fusion, we need to consider only protons and neutrons, since the electrons have all been, so to speak, boiled off, leaving the nuclei of the atoms that make up the periodic table of the elements. The simplest element is just one proton, and it is the nucleus of hydrogen. Two protons in a nucleus form helium, which for reasons of stability also contains two neutrons. With three protons, we have lithium, which is four neutrons, beryllium has four protons and five neutrons, and so on. You'll note that the numbers with each symbol count the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. Now each of these nuclei have what are called isotopes, which have the same number of protons so that means the same chemical behavior as the most abundant stable form. If one neutron is added to hydrogen, for example, we have deuterium. Add another and we have tritium. These are the isotopes of hydrogen. The simplest fusion reaction of the sun is between deuterium and tritium, which is also the one chosen for almost all the current earthbound research. So that's the reaction I will discuss exclusively here. The next slide will explain how it all works. To force deuterium and tritium to stick together, they have to be brought very close to each other. The problem is that both are positively charged, and as you know, the charges repel. The temperature in the sun's core, however, is so high that the nuclei are moving so fast that their individual energies overcome this natural repulsion. At these very high temperatures, watch what happens when the deuterium and the tritium fuse. Here is the deuterium, here is the tritium, and bingo! When they crash together and fuse, the neutrons and protons rearrange themselves into helium and an individual neutron. The equation for this process can be written thus. Deuterium plus tritium yields helium and a spare neutron, plus, you'll notice, a chunk of energy. Where does this energy come from? Well, it turns out that the combined mass of the deuterium and the tritium is greater than the sum of the masses of the helium and the neutron. And, as the most famous equation in physics, that is Einstein's E equals mc squared, tells us, given that energy is never lost, the missing mass appears as a huge burst of energy. And voila, we simply have to extract this energy for our use. This is the fusion process we hope to reproduce. The 
Research into producing nuclear fusion started in the 1940s, just after the Second World War. The advantages of this type of energy source are enormous. It is very cheap. The deuterium is found plentifully in seawater, for example. Uh, it's abundant. Again, there's lots of seawater around, although there is a problem here, and we'll talk about that in a minute. It's clean. There are no greenhouse gas emissions, virtually no waste. It's safe, no chance of a meltdown, unlike uh, the nuclear uh, fission reactors. It's inexhaustible. Again, seawater is enough to last us for presumably the length of the universe. There are many disadvantages, however. The main one is that the technical challenges are just huge. Electric and magnetic fields have to be produced uh, at the very limits of our technology. The temperatures have to be extremely high, in fact higher than the core of the sun at about 15 million degrees centigrade. The containment of this very hot plasma, as it's called, which is a mixture of the uh, deuterium and tritium, uh, is very difficult. If the plasma touched the side of a physical containment vessel, it would vaporize immediately. And the source of tritium, which I've indicated above, is in fact a bit of a problem because it's quite rare in the world, probably only 20 kilograms naturally occurs. Uh, and so it has to be made in order to uh, get the fusion reaction going. And I'll show you a little bit about how that is done in a later slide. Okay, we can now start talking a little bit about the research in nuclear fusion. There are a wide variety of different experiments, but certainly the most popular containment vessel is the Taurus. In 1951, one of the earliest Tauruses was designed by the Soviet physicists Andrei Sakharov and Igor Tam, and they called their machine a Tokamak, which is an acronym for the Russian description of a Taurus used for this purpose. In fact, there are now several hundred experimental fusion reactors spread around the world, as this uh, graph We'll show you, don't worry about the details, but you'll see the wide variety of them uh, being developed through the years. Uh, here is the, uh, the red circle indicates ITER, where ITER is on, on this trajectory. However, not one of them has achieved break-even. That is the point at which you get more energy out of the machine than you have to put in to get it started. It was soon realized that the cost of such machines was far too great for any individual country to build, design uh, such a machine. And so in 1985, when the Cold War was beginning to thaw out, Reagan and Gorbachev signed an agreement that they would get together in a consortium to build the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor called ITER. They were joined by China, European Union, India, Japan, and Korea. And the cost was estimated to be $22 billion to $65 billion, depending on who you talk to. The site was chosen finally after a lot of political negotiation in a place called Cadarache, France. The construction started around 2013, again, depending on who you talk to. And the switch on is supposed to happen around 2025, but again, that is a date which is a little bit ambiguous. It will produce, however, 500 milliwatts from an input of only 50 milliwatts. So this is an amplification of a factor of 10 over the, the magical break-even point. This slide will give you an idea of how ITER works. And some appreciation of just how fantastically complicated it has to be to do its job. ITER, in fact, has to do only a few little tasks. However, each one requires enormous technical skill. It must heat the plasma. Then it must contain it so it doesn't hit the walls of the torus and vaporize them. 
let's see how it accomplishes these most important tasks. This is a schematic cutaway of ITER, thank you J. Paul Getty, which shows the toroid with the plasma and the different magnets that heat and contain it. First, a current of the deuterium and tritium is introduced into a torus in a 50-50 mixture. This current of charged nuclei is called the plasma. The plasma is compressed and heated up to about 150 million degrees centigrade by applied electric and magnetic fields provided in part by these ohmic magnets, which also pinch the plasma to fit into the torus. Now, these toroidal and poloidal magnets together produce a resultant helical or twisting magnetic field, which is shown here. And this is, this is the field that contains the plasma and allows it to flow along the center of the torus. You will remember that one disadvantage of the fusion reaction is that it requires, in addition to the plentiful deuterium, the very rare tritium. Ingeniously, ITER attempts to solve the problem by producing its own tritium. A blanket of lithium is placed on the inside of the torus. You will remember, I'm sure, that there is an extra neutron produced by the fusion reaction, which is this one. When this neutron strikes the lithium blanket, as you will see here in this reaction, tritium is produced plus uh, helium-4 and a neutron. However, the tritium is what we're interested in, and that is guided back into the plasma to contribute to the reaction. And to finish up with, here is a more beautiful, but perhaps less uh, demonstrative cutaway of the ITER machine. You can see the magnets that we've talked about and the torus, of course, with uh, a representation of the plasma. Uh, you'll notice that the, the torus is not O-shaped, but is actually D-shaped uh, to allow a proper placement of the magnet and to allow the injection and extraction uh, at the bottom of the Ds. You'll see a little uh, indentation there. That's where that happens. Okay, so that's about it. Thank you so much for uh, listening. I hope you've uh, enjoyed it. If you have any questions at all, of course, uh, please, please call me or send me an email. I'd be very happy to answer any questions that I can, although I'm by no means, as you will have gathered, uh, an expert in this field. Okay, thank you very much and goodbye. And as the old cartoon used to say, that's all, folks.